Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture eight. So if remember we did last time with lecture seven, the coupling, we talked about how to build modules and a little bit more timing flexible when they communicate with each other. And that was all point to point, you know, producer, consumer. Uh, today we take that a lot farther. We're gonna now start talking about when you have multiple modules, uh, how do they interact together? We're gonna be using the couple of interfaces through most of this. And guess what, when you have multiple modules interacting, uh, they often have situations where they are contending for the same resource, or et cetera. So that's obviously a classic case for arbitration. So as a result, in today's lecture, we are going to talk about how to build arbiters. But you see, in order to get there, we need to talk about a few things, such as one-hot encoding, priority encoders. We'll cover those in just a moment. Uh, and then finally, we'll conclude by actually putting our arbiters to work to build a crossbar. Okay, so um, let's load it all up. And yes, so... Uh, one thing you may be familiar with from your other experiences in hardware design is the notion of a one-hot encoding, where normally when we try to encode a number in, bi in binary, we, you know, do it compactly in binary. So if I want to represent between 0 and n minus 1, I need, you know, n bits. Uh, alternatively, you can use a one-hot encoding in which exactly one of the wires is on, right? So in other words, you have n wires, you have n minus 1 zeros, and 1, 1. And uh, this particular form uh, is sometimes more convenient. You often can save the need to use a lot of logic in some places. Uh, it's kind of more natural what you need. Yes, this requires more wires, but often the way it's done, uh, it doesn't actually cost more hardware. If anything, it actually saves hardware because perhaps it saves gates. And so, for example, so, you know, if you look inside, you know, different circuits, where might you see this? Remember, maybe you have like a register file inside a CPU. You're going to have, you know, only one target register but perhaps for each register is in that register file, you only want to write that one target register. So that's the only one you want to have high. Or perhaps in an SRAM, when you want to turn on the right row to access it, uh, we often call it a decoder, same thing. And so, like I said, if you move into this one-hot world, sometimes you can kind of stay in the one-hot world and rather than kind of encoding, decoding, etc., you can just live one-hot for a while, all these parallel wires going around, and you can do what you want with them. Right? So down below, we have an example of a, you know, uh, we call it an encoder, but this is like a decoder, right? We have, you know, an n-bit signal coming in, uh, and then we're going to turn this into um, the various constituent parts. And you see how, because n-bit's coming in, that means there's going to be two to the n-bit's coming out because we're going from regular to uh, one-hot. Okay, so this is a fun chance for us to build our own one-hot encoder. So we're going to take as input a uint of, you know, with w, uh, and then we are going to the in with, and then we're going to uh, produce a one hot encoding of that number, uh, the much wider width. Of course, we need to raise it to the power two we just talked about. Uh, and let's try this out. So let's see what we've done here. We've, in this case, chosen to go for a recursive solution. So we're going to try and make this into a divide and conquer scenario. So we're going to go um, through the um, bits and just kind of figure out if they should be on. So you can see what's happening is okay, it's the original thing is, you know, in width wide. Um, however, the output's gonna be out width wide, which is a two to the in width, right? That's what the shift is gonna cause. So basically we're going through one by one of the bits of the output and seeing, does that match the input you're on right now, right? So in other words, uh, if we have an n-bit thing, we're gonna have, you know, n comparators saying, hey, is this match? And we're building this up bit by bit with a recursive function. So if we go ahead and, you know, launch this, okay, we, we've built it up. Um, I can go ahead and print the Verilog, and for, you know, two bits, it's not so bad. You can see basically it's kind of comparing a couple things. Uh, if I was to do, so let's say, four bits, it gets a little bit more verbose. Okay, um, questions so far? Today's going to be virtually almost all code, so I'm going to keep you on that page. <laughs> We're going to do a lot of stuff. Okay, so let's go ahead and what if we actually look at some of the outputs, right? So go ahead and, like, you know, Turn our print statements on. Uh, go turn on the test case to animate it. Okay, so you see, for example, okay, yeah, so zero is, you know, we aren't printing the leading zeros, but yeah, so zero, 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 one, you know, one, two, three. Looks pretty good. Okay. So you may notice how on the prior slide I had the standard library implementation there. Uh, as always, you know, when standard library things exist, you should use it. However, for lectures, we often implement our own things just to, you know, show how to make things. Does anybody want to guess another way to do this encoding? Is it the same way, or how would you guess maybe the uh, standard library does it? 
a bunch of XORs. Okay, want to explain more? Okay, I, I'm not actually familiar with that, so I'm kind of intrigued. But I mean, it sounds possible. I, I, I don't know more. <laughs> uh, other ideas? Lookup table? Uh, I'll give you a hint. Their, their, their expression is actually really short in terms of code. Gatewise, don't worry about that. But in terms of code, it's really short. It's not just them calling a library function. What might they be doing? Is anybody an idea? Well, you know, why don't we uh, turn it on <laughs> and uh, we can go look at the Verilog and peek under the hood, right? Uh, actually, what's, oh, what have I done? Uh, I'm going to turn off the printf too, so it's not making the Verilog too ugly. Uh, okay, let's go ahead and look at the Verilog. Dynamic shift, right? So if I have a number and I want to turn that into a, you know, one hot encoding, I could just shift the one over that number of bits. Now, uh, easy to write in Verilog, easy to write in Chisel. Uh, those of you who've done circuits or you know low-level digital design, a dynamic shifter is actually not easy to make. It's often implemented with a lot of muxes or something. And so, even though it's syntactically it's a very concise expression, we should know it's not cheap. But <laughs> I, I, I like sharing with you. So, okay, you know what? Sometimes different ways to solve problems. So, like you see today, there's some ways we approach a certain problem. And there's often multiple ways to solve the problem. It's a question of figuring out, as a designer, you know, which ones meet your criteria in terms of complexity, correctness is obviously very important, uh, or perhaps certain cost metrics, right? Cool. Yeah, so, okay, now we're able to go into one hot. Uh, any questions so far on, yes? Oh, great question. So I expressed that this dynamic shift, you know, but so in this case is dynamic shift, right? Because the shift amount is, uh, you know, determined that while it's executing. Uh, should we try to optimize this kind of stuff out? Um, maybe. So my answer to that is take the agile approach, right? Get your design implemented, get it complete, get it functionally correct. And then once it's functionally correct, then you can start evaluating, uh, you know, how it's doing resource wise, right? In terms of is it, a timing issue, is it a too much area, and then start going in and attacking things. And so that's the advantage of kind of the agile approach is that, you know, at the beginning when we're writing chisel, it's not obvious to us this line is very expensive or not, right? And it may turn out it's not. It's only a, maybe a four bit dynamic shifter. That's not a very big deal, right? If it's 128 bits, that might, <laughs> that might add up, right? And so the advantage of, you know, getting the entire thing implemented, the entire thing through the tool flow, and looking at the analysis of the entire design you can see where to prioritize your time, right? And so that's definitely what I recommend. So when it comes to optimization, today I will definitely discuss optimizations. But you're right, it's not proper in the sense that I haven't proven this is the bottleneck we have to fix. And normally you should kind of wait till you know it's the bottleneck you have to fix before you actually bother fixing it because maybe something else will be a bigger bottleneck and you don't want to waste your time prematurely. But yeah, great question. Okay, so... Given a one-hot encoding, another handy tool we're going to be using is something called a priority encoder. Now, this is an interesting uh, situation. So people often, you know, in software talk about, oh, yes, yeah, you know, a commonly used algorithm or a commonly used software pattern. Priority encoding is actually one of these uh, commonly used hardware algorithms, right? In other words, you have a hardware design, and this is a sub-problem that occurs very often in a lot of different design scenarios. So often that in your design lab where you probably want to have a priority encoder, you can just call up, and that way you can use a priority encoder to think about this, right? So what does it mean? Uh, it means given a collection of wires, and you know, perhaps a bus or something, uh, you want to find the index of a bit in order. Now, here I say least significant versus most significant, you know, but the point is whatever there is, there's some notion of priority, there's some, some notion of ordering, and you want to find the you know bit that satisfies the highest priority, right? And there may be multiple bits set, but you want to find you know the highest one, so to speak. And so this comes up a lot. And so I get some examples here, but there's a lot more to come up. And you'll see them in today's lecture, for example, in a processor pipeline, even our five-stage friendly uh, pipeline. Remember, if you're forwarding from a raw hazard, you want to forward the newest value of that data, right? So if there's like multiple instructions right in register four, you want the newest value register four to make sure you get the right data. And so priority encoder is one way to make sure you get the newest one. Uh, other times this comes up where you have, uh, for example, some resources you're trying to reclaim and you want to find the first free slot or something, right? And so... Listen, this is a really commonly used thing. You'd be surprised how often priority encoders come up when you're 
writing up arbitrary hardware. Chisel knows this. And so there's actually three of them built into the standard library. So number one, priority encoder, great. You give it, you know, n bits. It tells you, you know, a number back and log two n bits. Hey, this is the highest thing that's set. Uh, there's a one hot version, priority encoder 1H. So you see 0H and some of the um, naming of chisel things, I'll kind of tell you it's a one hot thing. Uh, or even interestingly, very commonly, people often not just want the index that's the most important, they also want to select something from MUX. And so rather than having to have a priority encoder in a MUX, it's actually just a priority MUX. You can straight up just pass in the MUX elements and the uh, valid signal, so to speak, and it'll tell you that. Um, a common thing that comes up with priority encoders is okay, well, It'll tell you the, you know, most significant bit that's, you know, it's on, but, you know, what happens uh, if none of them are on, right? What's the priority of that? Uh, it depends. It's actually not commonly uh, agreed upon standard for that across the field. Uh, but in general, um, it will return the maximum index uh, or zero, depending on if you're using one hot or the regular two encodings. Um, let's go ahead and see how I might build one of these, right? So if you actually go ahead and try and build a priority encoder, there's a few ways to do it. And depending on how you think of this problem, you might find it more intuitive. The one on the left, the diagram is not as pretty as I would like, but it gets the idea across, right? In other words, uh, when is zero the highest priority thing? In this case, we're saying zero is most significant. Well, if zero is ever on, it wins. However, uh, you know, what if zero is not on? Well, that is all these other wires here. So this is, this is showing, this is, you know, one wire at a time all being combined together into a make an n-bit bus. And so this is n minus one, you know, but here times up here, it's only one bit wide and it's all be kind of bundled together. Um, so you can see all these other cases up here, these are AND gates, you know, drawn, written uh, algebraically, not drawn, or, you know, in zero is not true, right? So, okay. So if this one is true, this one wins, and this one's not true, then all these other AND gates are in play and you can see, oh, it's, you know, not zero, but one is true. Yes, then one's the one, right? Okay, you can see, finally, you know, when is it going to be a case that, you know, n minus one is the case? Well, if it's not zero, not one, not two, not three. So this AND gate's going to get really big, right? This is a very big AND gate. Of course, you check out the tools and the tools. Like, okay, you know what? I don't have a 64-bit, you know, AND gate. I'm going to break it into a like, tree of AND gates or whatever it does. Uh, it may even do common self-expression elimination across these various AND gates, right? I mean, a lot of these may have a lot of common AND terms in there. Let the CAD tools munch on that. Um, maybe a different way of thinking which you might find intuitive is to use a tree of, uh, not trees, cascaded muxes, right? Basically, you can see that, you know, it doesn't matter what's coming down here. If this is one, you're getting one, right? Likewise, um, if one is true, okay, you get two, which is, a, that's a bit position, right? Because these are all going to be powers of two, these immediates right here. Uh, and you can kind of see how it fills together. So both of these things uh, will return the correct answer. Uh, both of them are highly functional. Uh, as you can imagine, both of these things have uh, basically order and depth, right? So if you have a big priority encoder, this adds up. So like I said, if you have only four or 16 things, I wouldn't worry too much. But if you have, you know, 128, 1024, uh, using one of these techniques, that, yeah, that could definitely be a critical path depending on how you're using your hardware. Uh, but this is kind of known. Priority encoders are kind of tricky to make fast sometimes. Questions so far? Yes. Yeah, so basically what the Gates one is saying, so it's kind of a little bit backwards, but we're saying that bit position zero is the most important one, right? So um, the way these logic equations are set up, uh, no more than one of them be true at a time, right? So this is, this is you know, uh, in zero. This is not in zero and in one. This is going to be, the next one here not shown is going to be not in zero and not in one and then and two. So that's what it is. So these, these are growing AND gates. And you can imagine, you can basically kind of feed them in. So technically, one way to develop this would actually be to, uh, you know, keep adding another AND gate for every level going up this way. Yes? This line is all the wires being fanned in together. So not easy to draw that. So basically, like, each of these wires coming in horizontally is one bit. So by the time it's down here, it's N bits. But, like, you know, here it's only N minus one. You add in one bit, another bit in parallel. So, you know, making the bus bigger, concatenating onto it. So each of these wires coming in is concatenating together. So this is more of like concatenating all these wires together. So basically, individually, we're setting each bit in the one-hot encoding. Like I said, the, the zero bit in one-hot encoding is only going to be true 
if the answer is zero, right? And when's the answer is zero? Well, if zero is one, right? If, the one, if zero is one. And so if, like, when is bit one true? Uh, bit one is only true if it's not zero and it's in one, right? Yes. Yeah. It should also be n bits. Yeah, not, not, I, didn't, I didn't bother throwing the slashes, but yeah, these should all be n bits. And that's why in this case, we don't bother saying the immediate. We just say here's the result of an and equation. It's going to be one bit, but that one bit, depending on where it's concatenated, mathematically is going to be some power of two. But here I'm actually writing out as powers of two. But yeah. Cool. Okay. Great questions. So we're going to go ahead and actually try to write both of these in chisel. Just to kind of try it out. Uh, so uh, you can see here we have a recursive functions. We have two of them. We have with gates or with muxes. So let's try it with the gates, right? Um, so how does the gates ones work? Like any recursive function, right? Uh, you got to have kind of, you know, your your iterative case and your base case, right? So um, in this case, we're just kind of go through the bits uh, one by one. And um, in this case, it's actually uh, going to build it up, right? We're just going to build up that sequence of knots, gate by gate, uh, and then kind of put it all together and we keep concatenating things together. So there's a recursive call in there. So it's going to do a lot of calls. Uh, however, uh, if we go ahead and look at the Verilog, it will do it the right thing. Now, in this case, we're only doing, you know, priority encoder for two. It's pretty, pretty simple. Um, as you see, it kind of puts the two things together. It takes uh, the lowest, you know, IO and zero like we expected. And then uh, this other one, which is ending the two cases, right? It make it a little bit more interesting. Say, what about three? And now we can see it get kind of more complicated. Okay, so... Um, here is the concatenation of, you know, the lowest bit we understood. This is now concatenating a two-bit signal. Uh, here's that two-bit signal being concatenated together. Uh, and yeah, we can see, okay, that, you know, this is one and not zero, or the other one is more complicated. It's two and no, uh, not one and not zero. Um, yeah, so this isn't the most human-friendly Verilog. This time it's not fully Chisel's fault, right? It's partially the way I build it up programmatically with the recursive function. But uh, yeah, so I mean, this, this works. Uh, questions? Yes. Great, yeah, so, oh, I'm so happy you answered that question. Uh, so remember how last time I was saying, or you actually, no, sorry, on Monday, I'm like, oh yeah, you can build functions in Scala that return chisel components without necessarily being modules. And we had some contrived examples in the lab or whatever to kind of encourage that, but Here's actually a really useful example where we're building a recursive function, right? We don't want to have a recursive function making a module every time you call a recursive function, but we're building stuff up in Chisel and we have to pass stuff around. So in this case, what this expression is, is that's the, uh, you know, intermediate term oops, uh, of, you know, like here, right? So it could be some fraction of this AND gate, right? And that's what we're building up. We're building up the AND gate, you know, term by term. And so you see what we're doing, right? We're basically... Um, ending on what was passed to us with not of the index, right? And then we increment the index one more time uh, and we can kind of solve thing together. And we also pass on to another function call. Uh, you know, sorry, sorry, this is passing on the next function call right here. But then we also, of course, and it together. So you see, we use that common term in both places. In the recursive call, we negate ourselves. In the real call, we don't. So maybe it's helpful to go back a slide, right? Oops, not like that. Um, if we go back a slide, right, so, you know, uh, at this point, expression zero, maybe it's not the right place. We'll go forward one, right? Um, we have in zero, so then we're going to, uh, negate it, and then we're going to end up ourselves, and then we're going to pass on the negation of ourselves onto the next level, right? And so you can see how the base case here, I, I just use one, because you can end with one, not change anything. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, I, I wouldn't call this trivial, right? This is a little bit of thinking to this, but, um, it works, right? Uh, we can go ahead and even try to, uh, not just look at the Verilog, but even like run it. 
And we're not gonna see anything because I didn't turn on the printf. So let's turn on the printf. Um, so you can see, for example, right, we're uh, given the combination of bit patterns on the left, we can see what's the most, or at least to say in this case, the least significant bit that's on, right? So in this case, for example, there's two bits on, picking the lower one, right? Here, there's three bits on, picking the lowest one, right? You can see how the prior encoder is kind of playing out. Okay, let's go try the other way, right? The other way was what Mux is. Uh, you can see kind of like we talked about, right? We have a recursive function call. Uh, perhaps this maybe is more clear, uh, but you know, similar in structure, recursively building itself up. Uh, if we go forward a slide, we'll see it's the same answer. We can even peek at the uh, Verilog. Let me go ahead and turn off the printf because it makes it better about the printf. Yeah, and you can see the mux is here it's using a ternary statement. Perhaps it's a little bit less scary looking. Okay. Uh, what do folks think the standard library is going to do? How do you think they chose to implement it? Or does that one have a favorite between two we just showed? Well, let's find out. Muxus. <laughs> uh, and if we were extra curious, rather than just looking at the Verilog, why don't we go peek at it actually, right? So we go pull up the API, which should hopefully load if I have internet. Maybe I don't have internet. Maybe I have very slow internet. Oh, no, oh. It's, it, it's trying, it's trying. Let's cheer it on. Um, I'll give it a few more seconds and see if it comes through. If not, this is not super critical, but using the API docs is an easy way to find things in the source code. Um, and I have no idea why the server is being slow today. Usually it's a uh, decently quick, there it goes, okay. So priority encoder, declared in a one hot as Scala. We can go ahead and click on that and go inside here. And you can see, first of all, a few things, right? Like we covered previously, right? They're choosing to do this with uh, an object, a companion object, right? Because that way they can have different constructors to kind of meet different cases. Cool, cool. But then if we go back to see how it's implemented, we see first off that actually, wait, <laughs> the priority encoder is implemented with a priority mux, right? We just said, wait, if you're asking, you're probably pausing for a second, wait a second, didn't we say that, you know, the priority mux is kind of like a priority encoder combined with a mux, and now actually implementing the priority <laughs> encoder with the priority mux. How does that work? Uh, no, it's, it, the priority mux actually is going to be um, implemented elsewhere, and it doesn't need the priority encoder to be built. So I describe it conceptually like it had a mux built in, but no, it's it's its own thing. This is fun with building a library, right? Building a library, of course, you can build things and then build other things with those things, right? And so in this case, let's see if we go back to util, if we can find that priority mux. Um, or better yet, why don't we go this way to find priority mux, right? In mux Scala, okay. Once again, companion object, different constructors. Um, and okay, so I'm gonna stop right here because right now it is telling you, if you look at these constructors, you can see that a couple of these constructors are basically calling the first one. And the first one's calling something called CQutils, uh, which is a perfectly valid uh, part of the chisel utils. We've gone there before in this class, but it's more complicated than they want to cover right now. So we're going to stop there. We're going to bounder search at this point. Uh, you have functional programming in there, and we haven't covered that yet. Okay, but like I said, it's kind of fun to see how things are built and how we might build things ourselves. And this is fun about using a language like chisels that not only can you build your own abstractions, you can use library stuff, you can read your library stuff, but hopefully the library is useful, right? So in which case you spend your time building things that are not in the library and unique to your project, right? Uh, cool. Okay, so we have one hot encodings, priority encodings. Now ready to move on to arbitration. Okay, so like I said, when you have multiple things intending for resource, you need to arbitrate. And this isn't just in hardware design, right? We do this all the time, right? You know, you have two people at a four-way stop, right? And like, there's only one intersection you can drive through. You can't have two cars at the same time. They're going to hit each other if they're going opposite directions. 
Uh, and so you have to have some sort of way to decide who goes first. Okay, well, who got to the stop sign first? That kind of stuff. It's arbitration, right? And so normally in hardware, we kind of call this arbitration, where we have this notion of, you know, you request something. And then if you win the arbitration process, you are then granted, you know, that thing, right? And so if there's only one requester, then sure. No reason to be, you know, greedy. We'll let them have it, right? But if there's more than one requester, we need some sort of way to decide who gets the resource, right? Uh, as soon as there's a tie-breaking algorithm available, you can imagine having a fixed priority, like certain grantor uh, requesters always have priority, or maybe have a round-robin priority, that way it's more fair. These things depend on your hardware design you're working on. Some examples of when you might use an arbiter in your hardware design. For example, if you have a processor that has, you know, only a single memory, and you have uh, both the, um, the cache and memory you're trying to write, how do you handle that? Arbitrate. Or perhaps even like a network switch, which you see later today in a crossbar. Uh, if you have multiple people trying to write to the same output port, only one can write to it. Well, only one can write to it at a time. So how do we handle that? That'll be an example of that. Okay. So how do we do this in Chisel? Ah, uh, well, as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, we're going to use just a couple interface uh, pervasively. So what does it mean? Uh, well, there's a couple interfaces on both sides, right? Uh, and so let's talk about the one on the left first, right? So on the left, if one of these, uh, you know, inputs coming in. Sets their valves. The valves going in left to right. They're saying, "I'm making a request." Right. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the ready signal coming back from the arbiter on each of these, you know, bundles is the is the arbiter saying, "Oh, not you're ready." In other words, you, your request has been granted. Right. So uh, this arbiter is doing its job. There should only be you know one person being granted requests at a time. So it only should be one ready signal true here at a time at most. Right. There could be zero ready signals true. Uh, likewise. There's a couple interfaces on the output of this device, right? Uh, you know, if uh, Val is coming out over here, that's the arbiter telling whoever's following the arbiter, hey, I have stuff coming in. I want to make sure uh, you understand that I'm going to be ready to send something. And then, of course, there's a ray signal coming back from here through the arbiter saying, hey, you know, whoever's on the other end, can they or can they not take the next thing? In terms of the arbiters built into the library, there's three of them. Uh, so arbiter, you know, is a simple thing to get going. We'll do that in a just a second. Um, it's fixed priority, so least significant always wins. So if you know port zero wants something, port zero always wins. Uh, again, so you can star another port if another port wants something. So to be more fair, there's the RR or round robin version, which of course rotates who wins, so that way it's more fair. Uh, what's interesting about round robin is that sometimes uh, because it changes every cycle, it's not quite what you want. Maybe you want somebody to have access to it, but allow, allow it to hold it for a few cycles, but then have some sort of rotation. Uh, that's what's called a locking round robin arbiter, a locking R arbiter, which basically is like round robin, but you can choose when you get the grant, how many cycles you want them to have it for. That would have kind of a chance to hang on to for a while, get some momentum, and so to speak. Yes? Sorry, what? So I'm not familiar with, what do you mean by read writer locks? So like, so like when you have like a lock in like parallel programming, uh, that's mutual exclusion is the property, right? Which is similar. So basically mutual exclusion is you're saying, I want only one person accessing this resource at a time. Um, arbitration is a similar thing. You have multiple requesters, only one person getting it. So with a lock, it's mutual exclusion, which is kind of a special form of an arbiter where you're saying, hey, if someone holds the lock, they've already taken it. And then um, other people can then request to get in the lock. And so depending on how your lock's implemented, there's a lot of different lock implementations out there. There's so many in the amount in the world. Sometimes, you know, you can get in line while someone else has a lock, so that way when they let go to the lock, you'll be notified or somehow get access to it eventually. Um, even if the lock is free, some systems you can just grab it if it's free. You first come, first serve. Other times if it's unlocked, you have to like wait and whatever. So it's a whole system. But it's definitely similar, right? In the sense that you have a resource everyone's contending for. Uh, and so, yeah, there's kind of this notion of requesting and being granted, right? So in a lock, only person can have it. What the arbiter is showing today, we're only giving out one grant at a time. So it's similar in that sense for sure. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, okay. Okay, so then let's try it out. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, the chisel arbiter. Maybe when we get started, let's not use the fancy one. Let's use the simple one. Uh, but we're going to use the chisel arbiter. However, the reason why I'm doing a whole module around it <laughs> is I want to set it up, right? So we're going to have some stuff for us to, you know, have some of the requests coming in to remove the control. Uh, we're going to have the output. 
So you see, yeah, we have this module we've made where we can go ahead and connect up the inputs, right? So we have a VEC of, you know, these decoupled ports coming in, uh, connecting them. Uh, we connect each of those inputs to um, these ports, set that up. And then, uh, of course, like the output to the output. And then we're also printing um, uh, the things that go by. So that way we kind of know what's happening. Okay, let's go ahead and run a uh, test real quick. So for example, so this is kind of showing, uh, you know, the ones are true for that bit position we're making a request. And so you see in this case, um, when all four are making a request, zero has the highest priority, so zero wins. So that's the one that gets the uh, grant. And so V is one, meaning it's valid, meaning there's actually a grant happening, right? So of course, now if only three of these bits are set, one's the next, most important one, so it gets the win, et cetera. No, so no one's making a request. The winner is kind of like an X. It should be an X in, in, in theory, right? And then the important point is not valid because nobody's actually made a request. So that's kind of the functionality there. Um, if I go back a slide, I'm kind of curious if I can use a bolt connect right here. I think so, but there's probably a reason why I didn't do this before. So we'll, we'll find out in a hurry why this is not a good idea. Uh, or maybe it will work just fine. Oops, uh, in. Or maybe not. Hey, look at that. Some fine lecture slides on the fly, folks. Question, yeah. Oh, yeah, why, why did I go from five to zero? Um, because I not only wanted to, there's five combinations, right? There's, you know, these four patterns of one set and then this fifth one here. So this is me, right? I mean, with four bits in theory, there's, you know, 16 combinations. But really, I just was happy to have these four combinations plus the zero. And yeah, you're right. The choice of loop bounds and greater than was chosen to make this line up this way. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so to be clear, right, what matters is that the, the, rather than thinking of the order of these lines, what matters is input, output, right? Uh, and so in this case, we had, you know, bits three, two, and one making requests, and one is the most significant, so that's the one that wins out. In fact, this test bench, the way it's set up, yes, I happen to, uh, you know, have this combination where I go count upwards here and then set the bits based on cycle. Uh, this made sense to me at some point. Um, but you can see the idea, right? The key thing is, right, think of it as more as just input, output. It creates, you know, a concise set of examples for us to play with. Cool. Yes? Oh, good question. So why is there a flipped here? Um, so I said the default direction for things you don't specify is out, right? So here we have a uint, uh, and we make it decoupled just fine. That's intended to be an output, that's an output. Um, in, in, oh, the question is, yeah, so why flipping on the outside of VEC rather than flipping inside of each thing here? I think both are perfectly fine. Uh, let's try it out. <laughs> As always in this class, let's just see what happens when it breaks, right? Um, sometimes things don't break, right? Oops, I might have the wrong number of parens. Let's go ahead and remove this other paren. Okay, now I gotta count. Okay, one, two, three, four. I think I need a fourth one. Right? Okay, that looks right. Yeah, it, it might work. It does work, yeah. So, uh, the key thing is, yeah, we need, to, we need to invert it, but you can invert it either at the entire VEC level or uh, per term. That's fine. Okay. So that was the regular order, which has a fixed priority, right? So, for example, if I um, don't even do this and I just say, you know, uh, right, zero is always going to win, right? Now... Sometimes it's okay. Sometimes it's not okay, right? So if that's not okay, what can we do? Well, of course, we make this a round robin. 
And now it's going to rotate who wins. So that means before our arbiter was purely stateless. It was purely combinational. Now there's state in there. There's a little bit of register in there to keep track of who won last time to try to move things around to be more fair. Now, in this case, um, like I said, they're all asking for it every time. You get one cycle at a time. Maybe you're in a situation where to make forward progress, you need to have the grant for more than one cycle. That's what the locking one's for. So you go ahead and uh, you know, make this locking. Then we have to add another parameter, let's say two cycles. And now we can see on the next slide that you see you get it for two cycles at a time, you know, one, one, two, two, et cetera. Um, I use locking RR later in this lecture, locking RR arbiter later in this lecture. I would say in practice and real designs, I use the arbiter quite a bit, the round robin arbiter quite a bit. Locking RR arbiter, we use it. Don't worry, it's, it's a real thing, but I would say it's used less common of those three. Um, cool. Questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's basically, it's saying whoever got the request gets it for n cycles, whatever that n number parameter is. So they're kind of like grabbing hold of it. So in that case, it's kind of like a lock. It's like a, like a fixed duration lock where it's like, okay, this is mine now for two cycles or four cycles, whatever you said is in that way. It's not constantly changing its mind. Yeah. Um, oh, how come the round robin roberter actually it was true for the, even the other, even the non locking one? I think, why did it start at one and not zero? I don't have a great answer to that other than that. Probably the way it's implemented internally. Um, oops, rerun it here, rerun it here. Yeah, um, perhaps it's initialized as a one or perhaps there's some sort of state in there. Yeah, I don't get answered that other than the fact that over four cycles, it did all four of them, but you're right. It didn't start at zero. I don't have a good answer. Reverse in what sense? Yes. What would that uh, mean? Because like I said, like the multiple outputs, right? If it's just fan out, it means duplication, right? So that doesn't require. Well, ready valid is the way we're implementing this, but the the, the thing arbitration is for is you have multiple things contending for the same resources that are contending on the input side. On the output side, uh, you're right. Sometimes you may have only one. You may have many outputs to choose from, and you may only want to use one of them. That may be a one-hot scenario, right? If I'm understanding your question right. Sure. So, so like I said, so, so in that case, right, you can think of it two ways, right? From the point of view of the queue, looking at five processing cores, you have fan out, right? But from the point of view of the processing cores, there are five processing cores trying to get work from one queue. So that's the arbitration problem. So thus they need to arbitrate to get access to the queue. And then the queue will give them work to do. Okay, cool. And yeah, as you saw in these examples, right, we have, uh, you know, uh, these kind of cute pre-made problems, right? But I mean, um, it's pretty arbitrary these test cases, right? I'm just kind of showing things off uh, how to kind of put together. Okay, so we just used a chisel arbiter. We showed behavior that's supposed to behave. Um, Let's try and build our own. <laughs> and so this is a complicated diagram, but we can talk our way through it. Uh, there's actually a few different things I want to show about this, right? So first off, how are we actually building this? Well, this is the, not the round order one. This is just simply the combinatorial one. So you see there's no state elements here, um, right? And so uh, what are we doing? Well, uh, if we go back to here, um, may not have been obvious, but the arbiter wasn't just an arbiter telling us one bit who wins. It was actually also passing through a UN. There's actually, you know, dot bits passing through in that decoupled interface. And so that's why in this design, ultimately we are going to be passing through bits, right? Whatever is going to get the arbitration wins is going to get the pass through in the dot bits. Um, so, okay, so we have 
the bits portion of each bundle being passed through, you can see they kind of broke the bundles up but rather than being, you know, io.reg0, ready, valid, and bits all side by side. I did all the bits, all the valids, all the readies in this diagram. So you can see all the bits go through in a mux. We're going to choose it uh, based on the priority encoder. Okay. And so how are we doing the priority encoding? Well, it's coming from the valids coming in. So anybody making a request has a valid set to true. So then we, of course, this is a fixed priority, uh, you know, arbiter. So use those to do the priority encoder, and that's going to help drive this mux. Then all this other circuitry is actually for all the ready valid signaling, right? We both need to tell people back on the inputs if they got the grant. That's the dot ready. And on the output, we also need to tell whoever's receiving the stuff that they're getting it, right? So uh, let's kind of go through one by one, right? So in terms of this arbiter being ready to produce output, that's the dot valid. This is an or reduction. In other words, oring together all of the valids coming in, if at least one of them is true, this is going to be true. So in other words, yeah, I have at least one requester. I'm going to notify my output something's coming. So the dot ready is going to be uh, dot valid is going to be true. Now, when it comes to notifying somebody, but they got the grant, the dot ready is true. There's a few things that need to happen, right? There is the condition that the output's ready to receive. So both output ready and output valid, you know, in other words, dot fire that we covered before and the ready valid signaling, that's this AND gate. So this is dot fire. So basically we're firing and you're the one that was chosen, right? So remember I was saying earlier, having, having one hot encoding sometimes makes your life a lot easier. We have a one hot encoding coming out as priority encoder. So there's end bits coming here. The same thing we discussed earlier a minute ago about, you know, peeling off bits one at a time. So we're peeling off one bit at a time. Basically, because it's one hot encoding, there's one wire that corresponds to each one of these outputs. And basically, hey, if that bit is high, that means you're the one selected by the priority encoder. And you end that with this, you know, dot fire condition. In other words, you know, they're both ready and valid. Then yes, you, you won. Um, so yes, yeah, so this diagram is a bit complicated, I, I confess. But... Uh, I want to highlight a few things, right? So number one, talking about the basic structure of the, of the arbiter. Um, number two, I chose a certain layout that happened to, believe it or not, reduce the amount of wire crossings. There's still plenty of wire crossings in this diagram. Uh, and so that, you know, let that be a lesson that, you know, sometimes hardware is like that. Uh, notice how, for example, a given port, you know, io.rec.0, the dot bits is here, the dot valid's here, the dot ready is here. Same thing. Just because you have a certain hierarchy in the way you write things in chisel doesn't mean when it gets physically implemented, it's not going to be implemented differently or something or moved around as needed. Um, and yeah, it's helpful sometimes people draw a diagram to kind of explain what you're doing. And yeah, in this case, there's a lot of wires, a lot of things going on. And as gnarly as all this is, uh, we can do this with Chisel. Uh, without Chisel, it'll be even scarier, right? <laughs> um, cool. Questions? Yes. I'm sorry, what, what, what was the question? Is it a DMUX? Yeah, like, like, like a decoder slash DMUX. Um, sort of. Uh, you're right that um, the impact of the priority encoder is that only one bit is true in this wire, in this bus. So that's kind of the one that at that point it's already kind of turned into a DMUX. But then there's additional ending to actually control the output, right? So we don't want to tell somebody to have a grant if the output's not ready, for example, right? Um, Sure. Okay. And then in theory, you know, yeah, so we're, we're, yeah, so th that's the thing. So technically we have a path here, if you're being careful, right? That goes from valid to ready, a combinational path, right? So if they, if they're, if their circuitry for determining valid depends on ready, boom, combinational loop, like we talked about last time. So we have, we have made this link here, right? So we, we have a conventional path from valid to ready. We have that vulnerability in this case, right? And as you just mentioned a second ago, well, why, why have that vulnerability? Why, why not, uh, you know, break this link here? And so we can have this ready be derived independent of whether or not it was valid, in which case there would not be the potential for combinational loop. Reasonable design choice, not, not crazy. Um, in theory, if somebody sees ready with, and they themselves did not, make valid and they should not be you know assuming that so perhaps yeah this could be something to consider for future you know breaking that link right there for sure cool okay so 
I drew diagram first because I'm going to show the code next, right? So uh, here's the code. Um, and we're going to do it kind of in two passes, right? Like I said, take this agile approach, get something working, and then look at it and go, you know what? I can make that a little cleaner and then make it cleaner, right? So first off, uh, what's our interface, right? As discussed, we have you know, a vec of the coupleds because input, we're going to flip it. We have a decoupled output. Um, for now, I can make things simple and just taking, you know, a uint as our data type. Later on, we'll learn how to make this an arbitrary data type. Um, we need at least one port, otherwise it's kind of hard to do. Um, for what we're dealing with, it's helpful for us to have uh, some of these things that come in as a vec of bundles, right? Remember, the couple makes this into a bundle, to actually have a, a vec of just those things, right? So all the val signals we're going to put into a vec, all the bits we're going to put into a vec. So we simply go through our ports, and we can go ahead and grab all the valids and put them into a valid vec all the bits and put them into a bit spec. Uh, that makes life a little pretty easy. Uh, right now we're doing sort of for loop. In a week we'll learn functional programming and do it functional programming, that makes that simpler. Um, when it comes to the ready signals, uh, so if we go back a slide, oops, not like that. Uh, here we did the ready signals kind of combinatorially with AND gates. We're gonna effectively do that. I took a little bit of liberty drawing that figure. Uh, what we're actually gonna do, if you can see carefully, is we're going to set them to false, and then override exactly one of them, right? Take, take advantage of that last connect semantics. Uh, in terms of how we're doing the rest of this, okay, given all of our valids as a vec, it's easy to pass those to the priority encoder. Uh, and of course, uh, given that, you know, priority encoder's result, the chosen, you know, in the one hot form, I use that OH, remind myself it's the one hot signal. I can feed that to a mux one hot to actually just get the bits portion handled. Um, in terms of the uh, valids, remember on the prior slide, we showed all these things being ORed together. Uh, that's what this thing right here is. That's an OR reduction. So in other words, combine those things with an OR. That's available on a uint, not a uh, vec, so I had to cast it. Um, now here's one little oddity here. If you notice, we had this one hot chosen. We're going to selectively turn the one thing that's on that you tell it it's on. But we need this to be not one hot, so we actually convert the one hot to you, and that's going to require some gates. Um, and then, uh, in this case, we're predicating this on um, the output firing. But as we discussed, perhaps we set ready based on um, the output actually being ready, rather than being dot fire. Cool. And. In theory, you probably wouldn't be chosen if you weren't valid anyways, right? So I think, yeah, this might be possible to change in a minute to be uh, io.out.ready. Uh, okay. So I'm not sure I ran that first. Let's go ahead and run it. Actually, uh, from that slide to this slide, I made a couple small tweaks. Uh, a lot of the same structure. Still the wires uh, of X, still a priority one encoder. We're just kind of doing this more concisely, right? We're so here. This is perhaps more intuitive where, you know, for, for the readies, we set them all to false and then selectively overrode them. In this one, you can see uh, we set the readies right away. We basically say, hey, uh, if you're the chosen one and is firing, this much more closely matches the diagram. It's going to set the ready correctly. Uh, and then the rest kind of all comes together. So uh, interesting stuff. And you also, may also notice, for example, that... Um, you know, we haven't even, here we're connecting invalids to priority encoder. Invalids, of course, was declared. It's actually not even filled in until here. Remember, this is hardware. So we're subscribing things, connecting them together to factor order in a different way. Doesn't break it. Uh, this is a more concise uh, expression. So we're going to go ahead and use this one. Uh, if we go ahead and run it, um, we can set up a test case where we're going to, you know, wrap it up. And then um, go ahead and run, right? And so we see... Yeah, like before, uh, we have this this combination. You know, if we always have the same input, we're always getting the same answer. We don't have any memory. Um, cool. Questions? Okay, so Nito, we've built an arbiter, and I think we still have time. Yes, we do. To move on to the prestige. Uh, let's put together what we've done to build a crossbar. 
right? So crossbar three has some number of inputs, some number of outputs, and you want to have connectivity between them. Uh, and this is something that, you know, is commonly done with generators, even in places that don't have chisel, because you really often need crossbars. And um, it's silly to write it from scratch every time you need one. So you definitely want to have that be automated. Uh, and what's cool about this, we're going to show this today in chisel. And the version today in chisel, I would say, is good. It's worth using. You're going to learn functional programming in order to make it even better. And so if your crossbar is arguably what by the end of this quarter will be like when the slam dunk cases, oh, yeah, you need crossbar. I'll show you that in chisel real fast, right? And so how the crossbar work? Like I said, you have some number of inputs, some number of outputs. For now, if this is a one-way network, you know, only going this way, you can imagine building two things to go two ways, but for now, let's just do one way. Uh, and notice how, yes, you have multiple inputs. Number of inputs and number of outputs are two parameters that are independent. And there may be multiple inputs trying to talk to the same output, right? There's only one output port. Thus, we need an arbiter. So for every output, we're going to have an arbiter. This kind of gives the high-level schematic for what we're going to do, right? Basically, just have all of these ports, and then just for every output, have an arbiter, and then use the arbiter to pick which input wins. Okay, so how might we go about doing this? Well, since we're doing kind of like network crossbar thing, we're gonna need a message uh, thing to pass around. So our message is gonna be, you know, a bundle. And we're gonna have both an address, you know, which output port we're trying to reach, as well as the actual payload, the data. Uh, now, here's some examples of kind of using parameters for fun, right? Here we have, for example, we need to know how many outputs there are in the whole system in order for us to size the address field but we did that, right? It's all kind of contained. That's all kind of nicely tied, tied in here. Uh, additionally, for example, you know, um, take a parameter for how big the payload should be. Okay. Uh, and you can see now for the IO for our thing, we can declare the IO over here and why not? Oh, some number of inputs, some number of outputs and the you know, payload size, the length. And you can see, yeah, we go ahead and the standard method using a parameter we, we just talked about. Um, and set the vex for us all nice and tidy. So yeah, in a couple of lines here, we now have this, you know, parameterized IO, which, you know, arbitrary number of input ports, arbitrary number of output ports. Their type is decoupled. The actual internals contains an address. The address is automatically sized based on the number of outs. There's also configurable payload size. So like I said, this is a tight little bit of code here. It has quite a bit of parameters, quite a bit of flexibility. Um, cool. Now, if you actually look at Writing up the crossbar, uh, what do we do? Well, easy. Declare the IO, right? We just declare the IO bundle. We can instantiate it. Check, right? Um, we also need an, out, an arbiter per output. In this case, we're going to choose to, you know, use seek.fill to make, you know, num out the number of arbiters. Remember when you instantiate a module in Chisel, you know, say module and wrap it. That's a little bit annoying, but then, yes, new round round arbiter. The round robin arbiter takes an arbitrary data type here. So in this case, we're choosing to actually have our, our bundle type here be the payload. Um, and then number, number of ports, sure. Okay, so what do we do? Okay, for every input port, we are going to uh, gather up uh, all of the readies from all of the um, uh, outputs, right? Actually, is there a bug here? Uh... Oh, no, there's not, no, there's not. Okay. So you notice how there's this pattern of there's two loops in a lot of places. And the reason why, to go back, right, there's a lot of wires here, right? You know, there's N by M or N times M wires in here. So there's a lot of these things that got kind of crossed both ways. Remember, even though I draw this wire, it's only going one direction. You know, internally, there's, you know, ready, valid bits. So there's a lot of wires flying around here, right? <laughs> So in other words, okay, for every input port and then for every output port, we're going to gather them up. And basically when we're all done, we're going to provide that input port in its ready port, letting it know if it's ready. And basically for now, we're letting it know if things are ready if um, any of the outputs are ready. Um, we're we're going to need to revise that in a second. Uh, meanwhile, then for the... Um, the gathering up, we're going to go through and read all the output ports and see how it kind of pieces together. Um, and then same thing for the output ports. We're going to connect the arbiters for each output port uh, to the bits. And remember, each, each arbiter for each output port has 
that arbiter itself has a port for every input. That's why there's so many of these things running in for loops here. Uh, and then, of course, we're also checking on the valids, you know, making sure, okay, well, is it valid? And, hey, is it even trying to message that thing? Is, is the address in that payload correspond to there? Uh, and then connect up the output of the arbiter to the output of the actual module. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot going on here. But then again, this kind of needs to happen. There's a certain in complexity that we're building hardware no matter what. And like I said, this is the kind of thing that if you wrote it in Verilog, you know, be stuck with one instance and it'll be really brittle. So companies often have cross bar generators, but at that point, you're talking Python, Perl, Java, the system together, Verilog, then it's why not just do it all in one language, right? Um, cool. Questions before we start trying to run this? Yes. Oh, okay, yeah, the good question was, uh, why did I draw the diagram as, you know, one arbiter per output port? Are, aren't these wires going the same for all of them? Uh, yes. The one thing that's missing that's in the actual chisel but not shown here, and I'll make a notice for next year, um, is that this thing, right? Uh, the notion of, are you actually making a valid request? So even though we're routing your bits to all the arbiters, the question is, are you actually making a request to that thing? And that's determined by the address field of your message, right? Are you actually asking for that output port? Because yes, you're going to have an input port coming in and it's going to be broadcast, you know, that data to all these arbiters, but based on that message address, it only wants to go to one of those arbiters, right? And so um, the way we chose to implement that was there's some data everywhere, but then have like an AND gate and a comparator in front of the valid signal here to kind of gate it going in. So actually maybe draw like a, like a, some sort of way to indicate that gating. That's a good point. Cool. Okay. Um, I mean, we, we can peek at the Verilog. It's going to be huge. I don't know if it's going to be a good idea to do this, but yeah, it's doing stuff, right? Remember deep inside there, there is a, a round robin arbiter. That's what that, you know, this thing is, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's doing stuff. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and do this demo. And so uh, in this case, we only have two outputs. Um, and basically, yeah, we basically are trying to message, and you can see that uh, in this case, I'm trying to message uh, the input port mod number of output ports. So zero and two are trying to go to zero, one and three are trying to go to one. And you see, yes, that you know, two runs the first time, zero runs the second time because we're using the round robin arbiter. Um, if I was to go back a slide and not use the round robin arbiter, you know. Zero and one would always win. Um, this isn't, you know, a perfect crossbar. I wouldn't, you know, ship this in the SOC quite yet, but you get the idea and get the idea pretty quickly, right? You can see, and like I said, what's fun about this, right, is you can see from internally, right, lowest level, you know, AND gate, comparator, connection. These are all simple operations, uh, but we've constructed them all in this big thing, right? We've built up abstractions. We've built up things like, the notion of our bundles like message. We've always used things like the couple to make that even more rich or VEC. But then we have a lot of Scala code actually doing these small operations many times, right? And so all together, we're composing something together to build something pretty cool. Even though at the end of the day, we're doing things as simple as basically connecting things or instantiating things, right? Yes. The crossbars do or do not scale. That, I would agree with that statement. So, uh, yeah, crossbars uh, have a certain size they work, and then for a certain size, that's, you know, they don't want to be made any bigger. Now, there's different types of crossbars in different scenarios. Uh, perhaps the scenario my colleague is referring to is we have, you know, different processor cores on the same SSC talking to each other. Yes, so crossbars are great. You can have all to all connectivity. Four, eight ways probably works. Uh, you're not going to 64 way crossbar between cores. Um, it's actually a wonderful. Uh, I would say conventional wisdom about which network topologies are the most efficient for which number of endpoints you have. And interestingly, this, idea, this, this was known decades ago. Uh, however, if you look at the history of multi-core recently, it actually follows the trajectory, right? So when you have a handful of cores, crossbar. Uh, at some point, the crossbar it gets too big, can't scale, ring. Intel was doing ring interconnects for their, for their cores for a while. 
at some point the rings can't scale anymore. Uh, what do you do? Well, you can do hierarchical rings, uh, multiple rings, Intel did that, or mesh. That's where we are now. So a lot of people are doing meshes. At some point, meshes stop scaling. And then you got to do things like trees. And guess what? That's more like we look at these AMD systems right now. They're hierarchical, like more tree-like, right? And so, yeah, there's a whole bunch of wisdom about which topologies make sense for the right number of endpoints. And guess what? That's a great world to be in where you have, okay, well, there's never always the right answer. It's like, what is the right answer for this problem and this, under these conditions? And with generators, you can, you know, do your best to encapsulate how a certain approach would work. And then if you have multiple generators, you can try multiple approaches. And okay, this year for our target design size, this generator is the one we're going with. Next year, you put different numbers into your generators and see which one makes the best answer. Okay, now we're going this way this year, right? And so you can see how having generators, having flexibility, and you know, being flexible to adapt is all enabled by a natural process. So good question. Cool. Other questions? Um, yeah, uh, that's all. This lecture often goes long, and we are three minutes under, so fantastic. Um, yes, another question. Oh, good question. How much is Chisel optimized under the hood? Um, it does a medium amount. Uh, initially, it did very little because it was assuming that if you did things that were bad, that the downstream CAD tools would fix it up and that would be uh, better and they would probably be more sophisticated than Chisel. It does simple stuff. So things like dead code elimination, like if things are really disconnected, DCE, it cuts them off. Uh, CSC, common subexpression elimination. If you reuse the same thing in multiple places, it can recognize logically and do that. Um, those are the ones that does most commonly. There are some other things that used to be optimization paths. They're now kind of done in a way that makes sense. I, I wouldn't even call them optimizations. Things like deduplication, where if you have the same module instantiated many times, you express the module only once and instantiated multiple times. Um, yeah, so, so there's a variety of stuff. I would say it does a medium job optimizing it. It anticipates that usually your downstream CAD tools will do a better job optimizing because in order to properly optimize, you know what the cost of the thing are. In order to actually you know, choose the right Trace of logic, but it does some stuff. Like I said, it's turned out to be doing some stuff inside the Chisel tool flow. It makes the real log easier to deal with when you're reading it and simulating that kind of stuff. So it does a medium amount of optimization. Great question. Uh, before this part, I want to remind folks about the status of assignments. So homework Tuesday tonight. Uh, good luck if you haven't finished it. Um, I'm going to try and post homework three later today, due in a week. Uh, Lapsy's already posted. And with that, have a good weekend.